Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. On today's YouTuber review, we will be looking at a heavily requested video by Sorel Amore called My Dietary Nutrition Guidelines. Now, Sorel Amore has been on YouTube for 12 years and now teaches other YouTube hopefuls um, with her public figure bootcamp, her advanced selfie university, and her Grow Your Instagram Like Me course. She now lives in a beautiful home in Iceland, and despite being an influencer expert, in July she mentioned that she was giving her audience an eight-month warning of her quitting YouTube. Sorrel suggested that as a social media influencer, she feels that she is always on and is unable to ever live in the moment, and because of that, she's just been thinking about quitting for a really long time. Honestly, I hear that, and I feel that so, so much. Honestly, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't wonder if any of this is worth doing because the stress and pressure of this strange public life is really overwhelming. But now in an interest to keep this video from being like five hours long, I had to pick and choose what I'm showing today. I did watch a What I In A Day video from Sorel, as well as a water fasting video from back in May, plus a lot of her other content. But I want to focus mainly on the video that I was sent like a hundred times because there is just so much to unpack on that alone. Now, before we start, a few quick disclaimers. The information in this video is for educational and entertainment purposes only, so you should always speak to a healthcare provider about your unique healthcare needs. Number two, any of the recommendations that I give for meals is really just meant to give you some ideas on how to add balance and variety and satiety to your meals and snacks. Whether or not one individual meal or even one day is balanced or healthy really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of one's health, especially if a person is eating in response to their physical and emotional needs. Basically, I give suggestions as examples and inspiration for you, but you could also gather this data for yourself over time simply by listening to your own body. Also, keep in mind that I watch a lot of a YouTuber's content, but I cannot capture a YouTuber's entire catalog of content, so this is not an all-encompassing review. Also, please be kind in the comments, both here and on Sorel's channel. And a trigger warning, a big trigger warning, that some graphics and some discussions may be disturbing to some of my viewers, especially those who come from disordered eating backgrounds. So um, definitely feel free to skip this video if you feel like that may trigger you. And of course, a big reminder to subscribe to the channel and don't forget to ring that little bell so that you never miss out on a video. So without ado, let's get into it. Oh God, honestly, I don't even like the original quote as I find it kind of reduces food to mere nutrients and fuel. And we know that it plays so many more important roles than that. But Sorel's version is like truly cringeworthy. I can't imagine thinking of our beautiful world as poisoned especially the gorgeous Iceland that she lives in. Um, as for the organic insert, well, we're gonna talk a lot more about that very soon. I'm strict on the food we eat because I have to counterbalance the amount of poison that is in our food, in our atmosphere, in our water. So this is why I put so much emphasis on eating the right foods, but it shouldn't be this difficult. I shouldn't call myself strict. The way that I'm eating is more so a normal diet, the way that we should be eating. Okay, so just prior to this clip, Sorel discusses how exercise is not the reason for her fit physique, but rather it's a combination of her having a natural small body and the fact that she is strict with the food that she eats. And as we hear here, the reason she is strict is because she feels she needs to counterbalance the amount of poison in our food, water, and environment. Honestly, I take real issue with the use of the word poison. This perception of food as poison or toxic or something to be feared and carefully surveilled is at the root of what we now know of as orthorexia, aka an unhealthy obsession with healthy eating. I'm in no means diagnosing Sorel with any kind of disorder, but I do find that this fear mongering as it pertains to the food in our food system is incredibly triggering and unnecessarily anxiety promoting. And telling people that this uncompromising approach to food is not only not strict, but how we should eat or a normal diet can lead a lot of vulnerable viewers down a potentially 
really dangerous rabbit hole in their relationship with food. I actually have a lot of empathy for somebody who has to go through their whole life fearful of food. I have to say that uh, we're not off to a really good start. No sugar. Elimination of sugar is one of the most important things that you can do for yourself. Confectionery, additives and sauces, ketchup, read the labels. Around five grams or under is okay. And now we're, when we're looking at fruits and vegetables, eliminating a little bit of fruits as well. This is hard for me to admit because I am a fruitaholic. I used to be. And the thing is, the closer you are to the equator, the more fruits you're able to eat. But the further away you go, the less you should be consuming because it's not natural for fruits to be in that area. So just because it's healthy in some areas, of the world doesn't make it healthy in other areas of the world. So, and that is talking about carbohydrates. Guess what bread is? Guess what pasta is? Yeah, when it's broken down, it turns into sugar. Wow. There's a lot to tackle in like just a minute worth of footage. Um, so I'm not surprised that Sorrel's first diet rule is to cut out sugar. Her definition of what a reasonable amount of sugar is, is less than five grams per 100 gram portion. Now, in contrast, most health authorities recommend no more than 10% of calories from free sugars, aka added sugars. So free sugars are those that are not bound to other nutrients that help slow down their digestion and absorption. So that means that we could find free sugars in things like honey or white sugar or candy, but not in things like fruit or milk or yogurt, where these sugars are bound up with fiber or protein or fat. So at best, if Sorella is just referring to free sugar, her guidelines are already twice as restrictive as those of major health authorities. But then she goes on to also suggest that we limit fruit and tell us about how when carbs are broken down, they turn into sugar. So now I'm not sure if she's telling us to limit all carbs to less than 5% of calories or 5% of a serving size of food. But unless she's suggesting that we all go hardcore keto, that is just not enough. The strangest thing about her recommendation is that she goes on to say that the closer you are to the equator, the more fruits you can eat. But the further away you live, the less fruit you can eat because it's not natural for fruits to grow there. Uh, that is so misinformed and like so unusual. I had to listen to it back five times or more to really grasp what she was saying. First of all, Humans have evolved to find ways to enjoy a variety of fruits and vegetables to make it easier and more enjoyable to meet our varied nutrient needs. This includes flash freezing fruits when they're ripe and out of season so that we can enjoy it later on in the year. Also, I live in Canada and we live nowhere near the equator. So does that mean that I shouldn't have any fruit? The reality is we grow a lot of beautiful fruit outside here in Canada. We've got apples and pears in the fall and strawberries and peaches in the summer, etc. And if we look back in history, our First Nations ancestors relied on freshly foraged wild berries as quick nutrient dense fuel. And we eat all of these local fruits, despite the fact that again, we live 7,000 kilometers away from the equator. Girl, this theory just doesn't hold up. Finally, Sorel mentions that because sugar is addictive, if you cut it out for a month, your palate will change and you won't crave it anymore. Now, I'm not gonna spend so much time on this one because I already have a whole video on the science of sugar addiction, which you can check out right here. But while the research is contradictory and very complicated, hence why I needed a whole long video to explain it, while I do think we can train our palate to appreciate more subtle sweetness in fruits and vegetables and other less hypersweet foods by eating less refined sugar, the research has not yet convinced me that we can retrain our brain, especially when there's a heavily restrictive mentality going on. Everyone likes to talk about the rat research on sugar having a dopamine response in the brain, but the researchers actually only observed this response when the animals had been previously restricted of sugar. In other words, when we restrict sugar heavily, we see obsessive and binge-like tendencies the moment we finally do have access to that sugar. It basically increases the reward value of that food. I also just want to point out that in her April What I Eat In A Day video, she had two Oreos for dessert, which I have zero qualms about nutritionally, especially after she ate like a massive six liter mason jar of salad for lunch. 
but it was a surprising choice considering how dogmatic she is now being about going sugar free. Liquids, mostly water, pure water. Three years ago, I was like, what is water? It actually doesn't matter. Tap water everywhere. Of course it doesn't matter. <laughs> Having pure water is a necessity. Having filters on your water, super important. The language this woman uses literally reads like the actual definition of orthorexia. Clean, toxic, pure, it's a lot. Um, again, I'm not saying any of it is problematic for her, but man, I know why you all sent this video to me in such haste now. Um, as for the insistence that you need pure water and use a water filter to get it, this largely depends on where you live and what your community's treatment of your tap water is like. So most water filters use activated carbon to absorb metals like lead, copper, and mercury, chemicals like chlorine and pesticides, and organic compounds that can affect the taste and smell of your water. Having said that, most tap water in most municipalities has already been treated to remove bacteria and any harmful microorganisms. And dissolved minerals in water really aren't toxic anyway. Also, if you aren't changing that filter regularly according to the manufacturer's recommendations, your water may actually be more contaminated than it was when it came out of the tap. So yes, a too old filter can easily add bacteria to your water because a moist filter is a hotbed for bacterial growth. One study even found that after just one week of filter use, the amount of bacteria was greater in the filtered water than the straight up tap water. Uh, yikes. Now, if it's a tasting, that's a preference and a filter may or may not improve it. But ultimately, whether or not your tap water is safe to drink will depend on where you live or how your community treats its water. But I will say most tap water in industrialized communities does meet proper sanitation standards and is very safe to drink. My recommendation is to check with your local water utility services for their consumer confidence report. And if you're still unsure, you can have your water independently tested for specific contaminants. Bottom line, use a filter if it's to improve the taste of your water, but know that these don't really kill bacteria. And if too much time goes between filter changes, it may actually make your water less safe. Okay, so let's see what other food rules she lives by. So mostly I consume two to three liters of water a day. Then I have one bulletproof coffee in the morning and then I have organic tea two or three times a day. No juices because the amount of sugar there is in that. Woo! All right, so Sorrel says that she has two to three liters of pure water a day, then her bulletproof coffee made with organic freshly ground coffee, organic coconut oil, organic coconut milk, almond butter, uh-oh. I don't know if that one's organic, huh? but she's also got lion's mane mushrooms, turkey tail mushrooms, L-theanine, uh, organic honey, and shilajit. She also has, of course, no juices or soda. So I'm not surprised about the no juice or soda rule since her first rule was no sugar, although not to call her out on her own BS set of restrictions, but in her May water fast video, she has juice as her last meal before she attempts a three day water fast. I also thought she said she wasn't having any sugar, but spoiler alert folks, honey is sugar and your body processes it virtually as it does white sugar, regardless of it being a natural, more nutrient dense option. But anyways, this is a unique take on bulletproof coffee. Um, we've at least got some healthy fats, fiber, and protein in the almond butter, in addition to the classic coconut oil, which is traditionally used in bulletproof coffee for its medium chain triglycerides or MCTs, which do have some modest fat burning properties. Unfortunately, most coconut oil only contains about 50% MCTs, and the MCT that it's most rich in, lauric acid, doesn't appear to have as many of those ketogenic benefits compared to capiric acid or capric acid, both of which together only make up around 12% of its fat. As for the medicinal mushrooms, uh, lion's mane mushrooms is often used as an adaptogenic ingredient and research done on rats and mice have shown that it may help to reduce anxiety, depression, and improve cognitive function. 
Turkey tail mushrooms are packed with antioxidants, and one review of the research on humans with cancer found that 1 to 3.6 grams of daily mushrooms reduced the risk of five-year mortality by 9%. Definitely exciting, though we don't really know what the relevance is in non-cancer patients. They're also rich in prebiotic fiber and have been found to reduce harmful E. coli bacteria in the gut. So sure, that is a worthy benefit as well. Now the L-theanine, she added, is another relaxing amino acid, and there is some research to support its use for anxiety and depression, while the combination of theanine and caffeine may have a synergistic effect in promoting cognition and attention. Finally, Shilajit is an Ayurvedic supplement packed with antioxidants, which early research on mice suggests may help to naturally boost energy levels and promote heart health. All of this sounds great and healthy, yes, but evidence in support of these supplements done on healthy humans is hugely lacking. And some of these supplements may actually be harmful depending on your unique health conditions and medications. So always speak to a healthcare provider about your unique healthcare needs before just ordering them on Amazon and throwing them into your morning routine. I eat organic whenever possible. Yes, I know I am in a position where I can afford this, but honestly, when I wasn't in a luxury position of having accumulated wealth through hard work, I was still hunting down as much organic food as I could. It wasn't very much that I could afford, but I still tried as much as possible to go to farmer's markets and buy locally. Hopefully those foods were better than what I would buy in a supermarket. Oh, okay. This is a beast, organic. Guys, this needs to be an entire video or maybe like an entire video series. So please do not rip me apart for not considering all of the research and all of the arguments for and against organics. I have way too many thoughts and I am just going to pepper a few relevant ones in, but just know that what I am about to say does not reflect the totality of what I think is important to consider in the organics versus conventional debate. First of all, I want to preface this by saying I am pro-organic and I'm also pro-conventional. I think it's nice that consumers have a choice and I see the benefits of both options for families. But I am not pro-shaming people for their choices or for demonizing options that are perfectly healthy, nutrient-dense, safe, and budget conscious. Let's very quickly go over a few things. One, people believe that organic food is safer because it doesn't use pesticides. Wrong. Organic farmers can still use natural pesticides, which I'll speak more to in a moment. And one 2011 study found that almost 40% of organic samples had synthetic pesticide residues on them anyway. I don't think that we can deny that synthetic pesticide exposure is greater in conventional produce and that the safety of some pesticides like Roundup is up for debate. But the current research supports the belief that the amount of pesticides that we generally get in conventionally grown food is officially deemed safe. Again, this is so much more complicated and even I have my own convictions and concerns around excessive pesticide exposure. But I think Sorrell's position is a lot more anxiety inducing than needs be. Second is the commonly held belief that organic food is infinitely more nutritious. A 2012 review found that while organic food may reduce pesticide exposure and the risk of ingesting some antibiotic resistant bacteria, organic food does not appear to be significantly more nutritious. Then a 2012 meta-analysis found much of the same results, so no differences in a lot of the minerals or vitamins like vitamin C or E, but it did find that organics had more antioxidants and lower cadmium levels, while conventional produce had higher protein levels. There was also a 2016 review which found greater amounts of omega-3s in milk that was organic, but since milk isn't a major source of omega-3s anyways, you kind of have to decide if it's worth the price hike. Ultimately, this is a really tricky question to answer because the results will likely vary depending on the specific farmer's farming practices. And again, I am just scratching the surface of this research anyways. But anyway, the third common belief is that GMOs are dangerous to eat and organic inherently means non-GMO, which is true. Now, I get the fear over anything artificial or man-produced when it comes down to food, and I also appreciate people's hesitancy to trust their government to do their due diligence when money is obviously on the line. 
But I just want to note that there is no evidence to suggest that any GMO-derived food poses health risks to the public. GMOs also have some benefits like reducing pesticide use, reducing food spoilage, increasing nutrient profiles in some crops, and in some cases, increasing yield for less land, water, and cost. This could help get more nutritious food to food deserts and other less affluent communities, which personally, I am all for. Research also suggests that there are no major nutritional differences between GMOs and non-GMOs outside the crops that have been specifically bred to be nutritionally superior, like golden rice. So golden rice, for example, was developed with extra vitamin A to support communities where vitamin A deficiency was a major problem. Now, on the topic of regulation, it actually can take seven to 10 years of testing before a new GMO crop reaches the market, which is why there are so few major GMO categories in some countries like here in Canada. However, a lot of regulatory bodies are not doing any long-term studies on the safety because they don't see any characteristics of GMOs as being unique or different from other kinds of foods. I have to say that this research gap is admittedly not something that I'm very happy about and definitely an area of research that I personally would love to see addressed. So am I saying that there are no benefits to eating organic? I think there are absolutely some benefits and personally, I buy some things organic and some things not organic. In organics, it appears that there are fewer pesticides and less is probably better. And there also appears to be more antioxidants, which is often why we eat produce in the first place. In organic meat, there are no antibiotics or synthetic hormones, which deserves a whole video in itself. And organic farming is often likely safer for farmers themselves who are exposed to very high doses of pesticides. And then whether or not it's better for the environment really is up for debate. That piece has a lot of spokes to consider. But my overarching message on organics versus conventional is that if it comes down to eating fewer organics or more conventional fruits and vegetables, I would way rather people buy conventional and eat more. I don't believe that the benefits of organics outweigh the potential benefits of more produce, period, especially if you're washing your food, which we should all be doing anyway. Finally, I just want to say that Sorrel mentions that when she couldn't afford organic, she would buy from the farmer's market, which is generally a suggestion that I agree with. But it's also been exposed that a lot of the alleged farmers at local farmer's markets are actually just buying the produce from the food terminal like your local grocery store is. And then they're selling you a foodie fantasy at a much higher price. So my advice is, if how your food is grown is important to you, and I think that there's a lot of merit in it being important, to then get to know your farmer, find out exactly how they're farming and what they're using on their soil, and don't just assume that an alleged organic food is inherently safer or healthier, period. But organic, a lot of people still believe that it's not important. <laughs> Putting poison on food is not safe. That's going directly in the body. No matter how you label it, there's been fertilizers throughout the ages that were legal for a while. They created so many complications for humans. And then people were like, ah, maybe it's not legal. So they retracted it. I don't have time to go into the history of pesticides, but yes, agreed. Some have absolutely been deemed unsafe. But FYI, organic farmers also use organic pesticides and sometimes even in more volume than conventional. And just because they're natural doesn't mean they're inherently safer. One example is rotolone, which comes from plants and was used for decades as an organic pesticide and is no longer used in the US because it has been shown to have Parkinson's-like symptoms in rats. So yes, over time, we are learning about the safety of pesticide exposure, and that includes natural pesticides as well. Please grow your own, own food, it's really fun. Okay, so I appreciate that Sorel acknowledges her privilege in being able to buy organic food, but it's important to also note that Growing your own food is a huge luxury in industrialized societies as well. Not a lot of us own the land or live in an area to support a diverse set of crops or have the time in our busy work week just trying to pay the bills to instead feed our own livestock and grow our own kale. So for some, this too is just not a realistic, viable option.
anything that I don't know what's in it. I haven't prepared it myself or if it doesn't have one or two ingredients in the back, I am not so sure that I want it. Mm. So it's these kind of statements that, you know, really make me sad. When food and food rules have such a tight hold on you, social interactions, which often surround food, become a source of major anxiety. This may feel like it's working for Sorel, and this control may feel like a really helpful coping strategy, but this level of control might also take up a lot of space in her life that could easily be diverted to other joyful, amazing ventures. But if I'm going to be binging, I try to eat um, as much as possible gluten-free. Luckily, we just figured out how to make pizza bases with tapioca flour and coconut flour, and it tastes delicious. Brown bread, I'm sorry. <laughs> you wanna think it's healthy, it's not. Grains as possible, they, they have to be eliminated. Okay, so Sorel mentions that she tries to eliminate grains as one of her food rules, but if she's gonna be binging, she prefers to choose gluten-free options. Uh, I mean, this all feels so exhausting. First of all, unless you are celiac, allergic to a grain, or have non-celiac gluten intolerance, there are very few reasons to go gluten-free. I am so grateful that we have a lot of tasty gluten-free options on the market now because this makes life easier and more enjoyable for those who actually need it. But if you're going gluten-free because you think it's healthier or that'll help you lose weight, know that the research doesn't really support this at all. In fact, a lot of gluten-free products arguably have more additives and less fiber than their gluten-filled counterparts. Grains are actually rich sources of fiber, B vitamins, antioxidants, and trace minerals, and there's tons of evidence to suggest that a diet rich in whole grains can help to reduce the risk of heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and obesity, and may also help improve digestion. So the fact that Sorel is binging on gluten-free pasta not only just points out the unsustainability of her restrictive diet, but also reveals a lot of gaps in her logic around general nutrition and food. We have been eating grains for a very short period of time compared to the evolution of us as a body, and we're not quite adept at eating grains just yet. I don't know about that. My gluten-filled bread recipe calls for flour, water, yeast, and salt. We haven't adapted to that, but we've adapted to eating all of the things that are found in a loaf of commercial gluten-free bread. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just poking fun here because the whole we have not adapted as a species argument against modern food is in my opinion an impossible one to prove or refute. All I will say is thank goodness for gluten-free products, especially the tasty ones on the market but don't choose them because they're more natural or less toxic or more like what our ancestors ate. They're not at all. Choose a product that makes you feel good physically and emotionally and accept that that is going to be different for different people. Next. A huge portion of my diet is just kind of rep repetitive. It's like veggies, 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 veggies. And for breakfast, I'll have eggs with rice cake. Otherwise, just fish, veggies of some sort, lots of greens, lots of, lots of broccoli. This does sound super repetitive. And I don't know, I can't say I like pegged her as being like a rice cake girl. But anyways, Sorel definitely loves her veg, which is great. I'm a dietitian. I cannot fault somebody for eating a lot of veg. Um, in her April What I Ate a Day video, she did have a large jar of salad for lunch and then a ton of roasted veggies for dinner, definitely exceeding her veggie needs for the day. And then we did get some eggs at breakfast, like a little homemade hummus at dinner, a banana-based smoothie at snack, and even two Oreos for dessert. But when I ran her nutrient analysis for that one day in April, her diet was moderate in carbs, high in fat, around 40%, largely from the added olive oil and coconut oil, but then really low in protein, just 10%. There was also about 60 grams of fiber, so depending on her tolerance, that could be uncomfortable or it could feel great. Um, regardless, while I love the veggies and in real life, I never really have to tell people to hold back on veggies, I think that she could probably pull back on the volume eating if she added a little bit more plant-based protein or fish or eggs in her day and even a little more fruit. No cooking with olive oil. A lot of people are under the impression that it's okay to cook with olive oil. Once olive oil heats up to a certain point, it becomes poisonous. So you are preparing your food healthy by your topping it with poison because it's cooked in that. I cook with coconut oil. 
back to the poison talk we go. Let's make something clear here, folks. Olive oil is not poisonous when you heat it up. It doesn't become a trans fat or toxic to consume. If anything, it just becomes a little less nutritious. But olive oil actually has a pretty high smoke point, about 375 to 400 degrees Fahrenheit, which makes it a safe choice for most cooking methods, including pan frying. Now, while research suggests that cooking olive oil at 465 degrees Fahrenheit for 90 minutes may reduce some of its anti-inflammatory compounds, you wouldn't even deep fry at that temperature, never mind pan fry or roast. So in reality, olive oil is, in my books, one of the healthiest, safest oils that you can cook with. If you want to hear more about some of the common misconceptions about oils and fats, you can check out my video right here. I also wonder sometimes if my body shape and structure, my high metabolism came from my mum's diet when she was pregnant with me and seven months before she became pregnant with me. She was living on a diet called Fit for Life, which was essentially liver and vegetables. And it was also the concept that if you were eating carbohydrates, you wouldn't mix it with protein. So say you had fish, then you could have salad. Or if you had potatoes, then you could have salad, but you couldn't have those three combined. Giving your body as least amount of work to do to digest, to get the most nutrients. I still try to do that as much as possible, not mixing proteins and carbs. Guys, I just, I just can't. Uh, first of all, while we do have some early research that maternal diet and pregnancy can have an impact on baby, it's got nothing to do with mom's weight loss diet having any impact on the offspring's metabolism. If anything, restriction in dieting in pregnancy is thought to potentially do the opposite by stimulating the thrifty gene and putting kids at greater risk of metabolic syndrome and weight gain later on. As for Sorel's food combining, well, I don't know, I can't say I'm surprised. You know, just add another bogus diet rule onto the pile until we only have a handful of foods left that are safe to eat. Now, I have already spoken ad nauseum about food combining here and here, so I'm not going to belabor this point anymore. But folks, a big reminder, your body has a bunch of different enzymes to break down different food components simultaneously. Eating protein and carbs at the same time doesn't create a traffic jam in your gut. And in fact, almost all foods, including a lot of foods that Sorel consumes, contain some combination of these nutrients. So even if you tried really hard to tease carbs and protein apart for the sake of better digestion, you likely just could not. Just topping things off like hemp seeds, sunflower seeds, sesame seeds, avoiding cashews, not good for you. What? Why? What is wrong with cashews? Why are they getting, you know, the short end of the stick? Um, I don't know, maybe it's because they're a source of dietary oxalates, which is an anti-nutrient that binds to calcium and can increase the risk of kidney stones. But I don't know, unless you're prone to kidney stones, it's not really something that you need to watch. If you're eating meat, try to have antibiotic-free, grass-fed, free-range meat. Otherwise, I would just stay away from it because the amount of shit that's in it is just not worth it on the normal supermarket shelves of meat. <laughs> this is another really big topic, so I'm just going to try to keep it short and top level. So again, do not shoot me for not tackling every consideration in these very complicated, convoluted questions. Um, but first of all, I think it's great that we have so many choices when it comes to meat and poultry we consume, or if we consume it at all. Now, research suggests that grass-fed options do tend to have higher amounts of vitamin A and E and omega-3s. but we're not talking huge, huge, huge differences or even major sources in the grand scheme of one's diet. So again, you have to really determine if the cost is worth it for you. Now, free range chickens, for example, must have access to the outdoors, but there are actually no real standards for what this even means and how long they have to be outside can really vary from farm to farm. As for the antibiotic free claim as it pertains to meat and poultry, well, the big concern with the overuse of antibiotics is antibiotic resistant bacteria, which I do believe is a really big problem. But the important thing to note is that buying organic or antibiotic free doesn't necessarily preclude you from that risk. 
One study found that the frequency of antibiotic-resistant E. coli was only slightly lower for chickens raised without antibiotics compared to conventional chicken. This is why it's really important to simply follow proper food safety protocols to prevent your family from getting sick from a food that may be contaminated with antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Now, I know that my vegan friends will say it's impossible to eat meat sustainably or humanely, but I agree with Sorel that if you do choose to eat meat, it's ideal to choose the best quality meat raised the most humanely and in the healthiest way possible. Obviously, this comes with added cost. So my take home message is that if you choose to eat meat and you like it, to use higher quality meat that you can afford as a garnish or accent to the meal and rely more regularly and more heavily on plant-based protein instead. Now, obviously, this is a bit of a different format from my usual videos, but since I briefly touched on her What I Eat In A Day video, I figured I would also briefly touch on her three-day water fast. And acknowledging how long this video is already, I will do everything in my power to keep my thoughts short. Basically, in this video, Sorel takes on a three-day water fast, which her boyfriend claims is for general gut health, to feel better, and to give one's body a reset. Most significantly, her boyfriend, who she describes as a biohacker, talks about the benefits of fasting as inducing autophagy. So autophagy is the body's natural process of cleaning and recycling cells in the body as a self-preservation mechanism to remove dysfunctional cells and regenerate newer, healthier ones. Research on autophagy is still in its infancy, but there is some exciting evidence suggesting that it may help to remove cancer cells, improve inflammation, and protect against neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. One 2018 review of the existing research suggested that fasting may induce autophagy. However, because the research in this area is emerging, not a lot of human studies exist as the majority of the research that we do have has been done on animals or in a lab. Now, fasting in general does have some research to support it for reducing insulin resistance, improving inflammation, improving heart health markers, and promoting weight loss. Animal research also suggests that it may help to delay aging and improve longevity, but the jury is really out when it comes to humans. So while I am definitely keeping my finger on the pulse on this emerging area of health, I don't believe that fasting is for everyone, whether that's like a longer three-day cleanse or something like intermittent fasting. And I do believe that it may have a tendency to promote very unhealthy habits in certain populations. I have promised you a whole video on intermittent fasting, which I promise I will get to sometime after this baby arrives. But one thing I do want to comment on was Sorel's suggestion that the reason that our ancestors had lower rates of disease was because they fasted to purge their bodies of damaged cells. Uh, not likely. While I believe there's probably multiple reasons for the health status of our ancestors, I just want to flag that the average life expectancy of a Paleolithic era human was around 35. And before the advent of farming, it was even younger. So yeah, most of us are not getting cancer or heart disease in our 30s either, regardless of whether or not we fast. Just saying. Obviously, I've outlined in detail some of the misinformation or what I see as potentially problematic delivery when it comes to Sorel's channel, but is there anything positive that we can take away from this? Well, I will say that in addition to the beautiful, beautiful imagery that she shares, there is something very romantic and encouraging about her newfound love of cooking and enjoying a meal with friends. Let's take a look. I honestly don't think I fully understood how unreal it is to have the opportunity to put so much love and care into a dish and then to share it with other, others. I used to take great pride in the fact that I didn't like cooking. I thought it got in the way of my material success and now everything is reversing. Obviously, life is putting things into perspective and living simply and sharing joys with people is so nice. Okay, so as somebody who also sometimes feels like a bit of a hamster on a productivity wheel, I can appreciate the simple joys that slowing down to prepare and enjoy a meal with others can bring. I think too many of us rush through our days with food just kind of tagging along for the ride and we give very little appreciation and energy to meal times out of fear that we're being unproductive. 
But don't forget that food is the only reason that we can be productive. Not to mention it holds cultural, social, and emotional benefits as well. So do not sell yourself short on your experiences with food. I get that sometimes eating slowly and deliberately is a privileged experience and so many of us need to multitask due to socioeconomic considerations. But I do believe that we can still place greater value as a society on sitting down to a meal. Sorrell has also said that when you do indulge, not to punish bad behavior and that she doesn't believe guilt or shame have any place with food. Now, I do agree, though I really don't like the idea of this being bad behavior and I'm also unsure if her actions support that message, but I will say it's a good message to share nonetheless. In conclusion, while I can't say I really agree with Sorrell's inflexible and dogmatic approach to wellness, I want to reiterate that she is seemingly on her own journey to figure out what feels best to her. Her dietary nutrition guidelines are in no way the Bible for good health. And while she isn't wrong about everything, we don't have enough evidence to suggest that she is right either. In fact, in the world of nutrition research, we don't actually have a lot of research to prove much. A lot of it comes down to what feels good to you physically and mentally. And I am just going out on a limb here, but I would say that keeping tabs on all of these rules, characterizing your world and most foods within it as toxic or poison, and restricting yourself to such a narrow number of tolerated safe foods would be mentally exhausting, socially isolating, and massively anxiety provoking for most people. So if it works for Sorrel, I mean, it works for me, but I do not believe this. All of this would be healthy for the vast majority of you watching right now. And on that note, that is all for today, folks. If you like this video, please don't forget to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below if you have any other YouTubers or videos that you want me to review. Subscribe to the channel and I will see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye!